Have you ever been a part of something that's bigger than yourself? I remember one of those times for me. Ten years ago, I was the associate pastor at Nicholasville United Methodist Church in Nicholasville, Kentucky. It apparently is my life's goal to be an associate pastor, and I'm just staying on that path. I worked there, and it was a great church. I loved it. I loved the people. And, and, and around that time, in 2007, 2008, we had built a, a new addition to our building, this beautiful, shiny new building, a big fellowship hall, a, a, a commercial kitchen, some classroom space. We worked really hard to, to drum up energy and excitement around that. And when we built it, we realized we had no idea what to do with it. So we had this nice, shiny building, but not a whole lot of idea of what to do until a lady named Adela came to us and said, listen, I'm going to start a, a free meal every Saturday for whoever needs it. And, and it's not going to be one of those meals where people come in and they take their tray and they go through the line. They're going to be seated at tables and they're going to be tablecloths and there's going to be silverware and, and we're going to wait on them. And they're going to get a restaurant quality meal every Saturday. And we said, this sounds great. We have no money. And she said, I'll figure that out. So she started to develop community partnerships, and, and she started to cast this vision of, of caring for people in need, and, and the money came in, and so on this Saturday morning in September, she opened the doors. And I remember being there with this, with this question, like, is anybody going to come? First half an hour, nobody came, but then they started to come. They came and ate that Saturday, and they've come every Saturday since. They just celebrated their 10-year anniversary, and in those 10 years, they've, they've served 88,000 meals. And as I was part of that ministry for the time I was there, and as I've watched it since, I've realized there's this beautiful thing happening, because as people are involved in something bigger than themselves, they're joining in with God's work and they're not just serving the poor, they're serving Jesus. If we want to join in with what God is doing, we have to come to this deep realization that God is working on the margins. That God is a God who doesn't stand in the center, but God moves to the margins. God works with the broken, the hurting. God cares for the poor. God cares for the, the, the prisoner. God continues to expand this reach so that if you want to meet with God, if you want more of God in your life, go to the margins. Go to the outliers. Go to the broken and hurting because that's where God is. It's not just about tossing some money in the plate. It's about engaging in this deep relationship. Harry Aponte, who wrote a book called Bread and Spirit, says that poverty is not simply about a lack of resources. He says poverty is about a lack of community and imagination. It's a lack of people who will stand with you when things are bad and who will dream with you a better dream. Friends, as the people of God who have been called by God and who have been sent by God into the world, we are invited and called to be an imaginative community who dreams a better dream for people who are hurting, for people who are lost, who walks alongside people in the midst of times that are difficult. We're invited to join our lives with theirs. Sometimes we, we don't do it because we're busy. And I'll tell you, for this sermon and, and every other sermon we're going to preach in this series, these sermons about practicing God's presence, being engaged with God's presence in the world, the thing that's going to hold us back is busyness. I say to students a lot, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Because busyness calls us away from God's work. It, it makes sure that we don't take the time to see what God is doing in the world. Friends, we are called, we are welcomed, we are invited to experience God's presence and to enter into relationship with the least of these, with the people who live on the margins of society. 
And the scripture we read this morning is this clear call to us in terms of what that looks like and how we should do it. And friends, you have heard this scripture before. I think, and I have not done any scientific research, but I'll tell you what, what it seems like to me. It seems to me that I, we have preached this scripture more in the last four and a half years since I've been here than any other passage. We've preached it. We've talked about it. We, we agree with it so deeply that it is on the, the narthex. When you go out into the narthex and look up, you'll see all of these things around the narthex. This is like our key verse as Suncrest. And I am, I am so glad about that. I'm so thrilled that this is one of those things we aspire to. And we do, we do so many of this, these things so well. And I'll tell you what, I am, I am so proud there are things that we do really well. Don't hear me wrong. But the problem with putting your values on the wall is that it's really easy to get used to them. And sometimes we forget to live them. And so this morning, I want to, to begin to, to, to nudge us and urge us to think about what it means for us to continue to live out this passage, to live out this call to, to feed and to care and to clothe to offer God's presence in the places where people are marginalized. Friends, last summer I met Jesus. It was a pretty normal day in my office. I was doing all the busy things that I have to feel like I sometimes have to do. And somebody came down to my office and said, hey Matt, there's somebody here that needs some help. And so I went down the hall and there was a a, a woman and her two children, she didn't speak any English. Her daughter, who was 10, started to translate for us. She said, my car has been locked up and I need to get my car out of the impound lot. Now this is not a normal, this is not a normal uh, ask for assistance like I normally get. And so I sat down to try and figure out what was going on and had this conversation with this lady through her daughter. She is a, she's a, an immigrant worker trying to find work and she had heard somehow that somebody had worked for her here. So she drove here and the lady said, park your car at Kroger and then come to my house. And for the last two weeks, she had been working at this lady's house, gardening, taking care of her children, cleaning. In the two weeks that she worked for the lady, the lady paid her $40. And she had no recourse. She went back to find her car and of course it was gone because it had been parked in the Kroger parking lot for two weeks. And so she came here. So I started making some phone calls, and I find her car, and I, I pay the impound fee, and I, and I tell her where it is, and I say, listen, go get your car, and, and I, good luck, and here's my cell phone. If you need me, call me. That night at like 5 o'clock, my phone rang again, and I answered it, and it was the little girl, and she said, we're at Sheets, and our car is broken. Can you come help? Now, broken cars aren't my strong suit, but I was willing to do my best, and so I I drove to Sheets and found them, and she had dropped her keys. They'd slipped out of her hand, and they'd hit just right, and the key had sheared off, and it was the only key she had. So I figured out that for her to get a key, we had to go to the Kia dealership and get a key, but the Kia dealership was closed, and they didn't have a place to stay, so I found them a hotel room, and I said, have you eaten anything? And they said, no, so we went and bought all the double cheeseburgers we could find, and I took them to the hotel and, and left them and picked them up the next morning, and took them to the Kia dealership, and we got the key. I said, where are you going? They said, we're going to meet, she was going to meet her husband in Florida. He was working in Florida. And so it was gonna be a long drive. They didn't have any money. I filled up their, gar their car with gas and said a prayer and sent them on their way. I wonder what happened to them. I think about them all the time. I don't know any more of the story. But here's what I know. When I drove home that day, I was pretty sure I had met Jesus. Because that's one of the other crazy, stunning things about this whole passage. That is, as, as Jesus tells this story, what he's really saying is, the poor and the broken among you have a certain dignity that you can't take away from them because my image lives in them. My very presence lives in them. You see, the poor are not our project. They are our people. And we are invited to engage in deep relationship. We're invited to know them and to hear their stories. We're invited to realize that they are no different than we are. Not too long ago, a lady came, needed some help, and I helped her. And she was, she had a, she, she'd been having a pretty rough time. She looked at me and she said, 
Preacher, I really want to go to church, but I don't think any church will take me like this. And I really wanted to say, well, we will. But I didn't know. You see, friends, it's not just putting ourselves approximate to suffering, it's inviting suffering. It's inviting the hurting and the broken. It's welcoming people into our midst who don't look, act, or smell like we do. If we can do that, we will become a part of something that's so much bigger than we are. And our story will not be ours alone, but it will be woven into God's beautiful redemptive story that's doing great work in the world. So friends, let's be people who seek out God on the margins.